they have lit a fire in Fannie Lou. They have started something in Ruleville, Mississippi, because what they thought they were doing was suppressing this woman. They thought they were silencing this woman. All they were doing was incensing this woman, fueling this woman's fire. And this is her story. Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. It's great to be here with you. Today I'm talking about Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a sharecropper turned human rights activist. Fannie Alma Louise Du Bois Townsend was born October 6, 1917. She was the youngest of 20 children, 14 boys and six girls. Her parents, James Lee and Luella Townsend, were sharecroppers. Her father was a sharecropper as well as a Baptist minister. When Fannie Lou Hamer was two years old, her parents um, moved the family to E.W. Brandon's plantation, which was located in Sunflower County in Ruleville, Mississippi. Now, one thing to understand about sharecropping is that after slavery ended, the southern states had no way of making money. So sharecropping was actually um, used as a means for these big plantations on the south that had been ran on slave labor. And of course, slavery is now outlawed. So in order for these plantations to run smoothly, and cheap and as for as cheap as possible they would um, have sharecroppers come and kind of rent out parcels of land on the plantation and the sharecroppers would work that land uh, harvest whatever the crop was and in um, Fannie Lou Hamer's case it was cotton so she picked cotton up until she was about 44 years old. The way that the sharecropping system was set up, um, black people were still not able to get ahead. They were not paid fairly. Um, and so they still were living in poverty and not really seeing any money um, as a result of their hard labor in the fields. As a child, Fannie Lou Hamer had an awareness that they were working so hard, her family worked so hard in the fields, but they still struggled. They still did not have food to eat. Fannie Lou did attend school like other sharecropper children. However, um, they only went to school for about two months out of the year. And Lou Hamer was able to stay in school up to the sixth grade in which she had to um, come out of school and help the family full time. When she was in school, she did pretty well. She was a good speller. Um, she was good at learning poetry and her parents were very proud of her and um, always encouraged her growing up. Just like her mom, Fannie Lou married a sharecropper, Perry Hamer, in 1944, and they moved to the W.D. Marlowe Plantation. Perry drove a tractor and Fannie Lou was the timekeeper, which was a um, job that had lots of responsibility. In 1961, Hamer uh, went in to have a surgery to remove a uterine tumor. The white doctor who operated on her, instead of simply removing the tumor, he gave her a full hysterectomy without her consent. At the time, this, is, this was called a Mississippi appendectomy, where they would sterilize black women um, to try and um, slow down the growth of the black population. And so this happens to Fannie Lou Hamer. After the sterilization, 
um, because she could not have children, uh, she and her husband adopt two daughters. On August 27, 1962, Fannie Lou Hamer attends a meeting at her church led by activists who were there to try and mobilize Mississippians to register to vote. People who lived in Fannie Lou Hamer's community in Ruleville had no idea that Blacks were allowed to vote. Blacks had been given the right to vote in 1870. Here we are in 1962, and these people had no idea that this was their constitutional right. And that angered Fannie Lou Hamer, and she decided that she would go down and register to vote. So a few days later, on August 31st, she and 17 other people went down to sound the Sunflower County Courthouse in Indianola, Mississippi, um, to attempt to register to vote. When they got there, they were presented with a literacy test. And in order to become a registered voter, you would have to pass this literacy test. These are sharecroppers with very limited education. So um, long story short, Fannie Lou Hamer did not pass the literacy test. So she went on back home to W.D. Marlowe's plantation. Upon returning home, her boss, Marlowe, fires her from her job because she went to attempt to register to vote. And he tells her that she has to go back and withdraw her registration um, or she would have to leave. And even if she did go to withdraw, she may still have to leave. She told him that she was registering to vote for herself and not for him. And he immediately told her she had to leave. So that night she had to go. She had to pack up and go. Her husband was forced to stay. Um, he had to stay until after the harvest was over. So she left him that very night and went and stayed with a friend. A few weeks later, someone comes and shoots up the house where Fannie Lou Hamer had been staying. Uh, luckily, she was not there at the time, but this was an example of what would happen in Mississippi, how white supremacists would try to intimidate black people Getting fired from her job was a game changer for Fannie Lou Hamer because now she's able to focus 100% on the civil rights movement. She joined the SNCC, which is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, where she attends workshops that help teach her how to encourage people to vote and how to get people in her community active in politics. Then in January of 1963, Fannie Lou Hamer goes back to try to register to vote a second time. And this time she does pass the literacy test and she becomes one of the first black registered voters in her community. Six months later, in June of 1963, in Winona, Mississippi, um, Fannie Lou Hamer is returning from a voter registration workshop with some other individuals and they are riding a bus. They arrest Fannie Lou Hamer and the people, the other people who were on the bus um, on some trumped up charges and they take them to jail. And Fannie Lou Hamer um, chronicles this this famously and we'll, I'm gonna get to that but um, so they they lock her up so she's in her jail cell and she can hear screams coming from um, other other areas of the of the jail house and she can hear screams she hears licks like people getting hit. Um, and she sees um, 
people that she was with, a, a girl she was with who was 15 years old, walk past her jail cell, all bloodied. She hears the um, officer tell someone to mop up the blood off the floor. Um, three white officers enter her jail cell, which she is in with another woman, remove her from the cell and take her to another cell where there are two black men, two black prisoners, um, and uh, the white officer orders the black prisoners to beat her. These officers have given these other two black men who were prisoners at the jail, give them corn whiskey and um, tell them to beat her. So the first one, begins to beat her. I mean, the officer gave him some kind of weapon to beat her with. So the first guy beats her until he can't beat her anymore. He's tired. Then the officer tells the second black prisoner to beat, black male prisoner to beat her. He beats her um, with this weapon. The, the officer gives it now to the second guy. And so he proceeds to beat her. And um, she's beaten so badly that she has injuries for the rest of her life as a result of that beating. Um, a white officer comes over as she starts to move her feet. A black, um, the black prisoner is told to sit on her feet so she can't move her feet. And then the black, a white officer comes and beats her in her head when she's screaming. Um, so. Uh, this happens to her and this is, you know, of course, extremely traumatizing. This um, put in her mind a disdain for the police. She could not no longer trust the police after this incident happened to her. Going through something like that, getting beat to the very end of your life, you would think that would intimidate or deter someone from moving forward and proceeding on that same path that they tried to push her from. That simply strengthened her. That gave her a story to tell. You know what happened to me? In that next spring, she becomes the first black woman to run for Congress. It was an unsuccessful run, but she ran. On August 22nd, 1964, um, Hamer's reputation soared. That was the day that she became famous. Fannie Lou Hamer had an ideology and her ideology was this. If I am not free, you are not free either. Both races um, suffered from this system. Both races. Black people are suffering and white people are also suffering. She co-founded the MFDP, Mississippi Freedom Democracy Party. They intended to represent Mississippi at the Democratic National Convention. That was their goal. Um, however, the way that the system is set up, there is already a group who gets to go to the Democratic National Convention in order to nominate a presidential candidate. And of course, those um, the people in that group are white men, but they are the ones who regularly represent the state of Mississippi at the Democratic National Convention. So here she is at the Democratic National Convention and she is slated to testify on behalf of the MFDP to become recognized as an official delegation. Fannie Lou Hamer testifies 
about her experience trying with her from trying to register to vote and everything that happened to her thereafter. First, she introduces herself. She let all these political big wigs know um, this is how you're going to address me. And then she proceeds, and this is a sharecropper. She is from Rural, Mississippi. No, she is poor, poverty, and it's all. But she goes in there and she lets them know. She goes into everything she had endured as a result of her exercising her human right to vote in America. She talks about getting fired from her job, getting evicted from her home, um, having to leave her husband. Um, she speaks about her arrest. She names names of the officers where she lives because she is not able to vote or because pe certain people are not able to vote, they are not being represented properly. So how can this be a democracy? Another thing about Fannie Lou Hamer is that she's a great orator. She is able to, she's so simple and plain in the way that she speaks in a time when you had people like Martin Luther King Jr., he was a, a great orator as well. He had a whole different style though. Like he used to, you know, the big words spoke very poetically sometimes. Um, you had Malcolm Max and, the, and his style of speaking. And you had Fannie Lou Hamer and she was very um, direct as she says, she just tells it like it is. So apparently um, word got to Lyndon B. Johnson, the president of the United States um, about what Fannie Lou Hamer was going to be talking about because he attempted to um, block her from being broadcast. This was being broadcast on national television. This, her testifying about what happened to her in prison and this, excuse me, in jail. And this is the first time the nation is hearing about this type of thing because this is what's happening in Ruleville, Mississippi. Ruleville, Mississippi is off the grid. So you don't know what's going on over there. You don't know that the police are beating women in jail. You don't know that if you're over in Manhattan, death threats, church bombings. This all was going on in Mississippi. And what Fannie Lou Hamer is saying is, hey, this is happening right here in America. This is how you, but you call this a democracy. This is supposed to be fair. So this is going to be broadcast on news networks. So Lyndon B. Johnson tries to block it by holding a press conference. The television stations are switching to Lyndon B. Johnson. However, the networks air Fannie Lou Hamer later that night. So people see her speech. People were horrified by what they heard that was happening um, down there. It just, it wasn't a good look for Mississippi. It wasn't a good look for America. Much of my research I got um, from this book, I am quoting from the book, Hamer testified about how white supremacists withheld basic human necessities like food, water, shelter, and health care to punish black activism in Mississippi. Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony catapulted her to um, success. It catapulted her name, her legacy. I'm going to put um, the link to her speech at the Democratic National Convention. But please watch 
finish watching this video before you go and watch that. After this testimony, the Democratic Party vowed that they would never seat a segregated delegation again at the Democratic National Convention. This speech changed politics from here on out. Um, the Democrats became integrated, this liberal kind of party. Your Southern um, Democrats who didn't like this went over to the Republican Party. Over the course of her 15 years as a human rights activist from 1962, when she went to try to register to vote, to her demise in 1977, um, she shared platforms with the likes of Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, Ella Baker, the list goes on. Um, Malcolm X. Malcolm X referred to her as the country's number one freedom fighting woman. Of course, she also marched alongside everybody. Now, um, Fannie Lou Hamer was not a healthy woman but she was out there, she was marching. She marched alongside John Lewis, Andrew Young, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. She was asked to speak at colleges and universities all over the country, including Harvard, Duke, um, the University of Wisconsin, Madison. She received three honorary doctorates um, one from Howard University. In 1968, Fannie Lou Hamer uses money that she has um, made from her speeches and things, and uh, she gets money donated, and she starts a food bank to nourish the people in her community. In 1969, um, she buys the first 40 acres of Freedom Farm. And Freedom Farm was a co-op established to provide food and jobs for people in the community. Eventually it grows to 700 acres and they are the third largest employer in Sunflower County which is where she's from. Please like if you liked. Subscribe if you would like more. <laughs>